I just wanted to share this study with you. Uh, and as you can see, it's a preliminary study. Uh, it's for the dissemination results. Uh, it's very early on. Uh, this isn't a study that's been studied time and time again, as unfortunately we're very really early on in COVID still. I know it seems like it's been a long time for those that are in the moment and watching this uh, relatively close to the recording being published, but uh, it's really still an early virus, um, and therefore every study we have is going to be early on and hasn't had a really good chance to be proven time and time again. But I do want to share this with you because that's all we kind of that's all the kind of research we're able to base uh, what we have off of. So this study comes out of Indonesia. It's regarding the patterns of COVID-19 mortality and vitamin D. So going right into the study here, it's found that the majority of COVID-19 cases with insufficient or deficient vitamin D status died. Uh, the odds of death was higher in older males with pre-existing conditions and below normal vitamin D levels. Now, up to this point, we're very well aware that those pre-existing conditions have disproportionately been affected as far as death is concerned. Not as far as getting COVID-19 or following through with the disease, but as far as death is concerned. So the study did control for age, sex, and comorbidity, looking at vitamin D status. Um, we're, I'm going to get in a little bit more detail on how that kind of works a little as well. But, and this was a randomized controlled trial looking at vitamin D supplementation on COVID-19 outcomes and establishing an underlying mechanism. So let's just skip right into, uh, we're going to skip right past the abstract. We're going to look right into the study itself here. So as you can see on the page, the coronavirus 2019 or COVID-19 pandemic remains a pressing problem in the world and will continually surface as more than 30 different mutations of the disease strain, severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, coronavirus, were detected in the latest study in China. So there's 30 different strains detected. So now even early on, we've looked back at history and we've stated that the scariest thing is when a virus can mutate because we're looking at the probability is that, yes, it affects the elderly right now, okay, in this, in this current day that we're looking at. Uh, not, again, as far as getting it, but as far as those dying from it. But as things resurface and we're looking maybe a year or two down the line, at minimum, uh, and the virus stays around in the population for a extended period of time, it does have that chance of mutating and turning into new strains. And as a result, it can affect younger people, a different demographic than it affected the first time. So we do have to be considerate of that when we're looking at this data or what we're looking at with safety protocols and saying, oh, but it didn't affect me. I don't have to worry about it. Um, this is something to be concerned about. So continuing on, it says, with the increasing number of novel strains, researchers across the world are driven to conduct clinical trials for potential antiviral treatments. However, the likelihood of potential vaccines for the disease went down due to more evidence debuting previous claims on the efficacy of the tested drugs. Scientists continue to search for effective treatments with efforts focused on several existing drugs. Uh, now I'm gonna kind of supplement a piece in here that's not in the study, uh, that one of the drugs that they're looking at, a couple of the drugs they're looking at actually, are the regimens for HIV treatment. Which is a group of drugs originally known as HART, H-A-A-R-T, uh, which stands for Highly Active Antiretroviral Therapy. Um, came about in 1995. Uh, it was also known as the AIDS cocktail. Uh, it's now more commonly known as CART, C-A-R-T. That's a lowercase c, uh, uppercase A-R-T, uh, which would be combination 
anti-retroviral therapy, uh, or simply just ART, A-R-T, uh, which is anti-retroviral therapy. So those same treatment protocols are being looked at heavily uh, in this. We know that they're effective. We know that they work. We know that they're, they've worked with humans and they've been to the current day, been keeping people alive for somewhere between 30 or 36 years, depending on when they contracted HIV. So we know it's, we know for the long term that these treatments do work, that they are safe to use, not that any type of treatment, especially at that level, doesn't come with side effects, but it is safe. So we're at least we can cut past that part of it and use something existing towards as a treatment because we can cut past the long-term effect part of that treatment of the um, testing. So cutting right into the core of what we're here looking at, saying vitamin D has been proven to enhance expression of antioxidation related genes, module its adaptive immunity and improve cellular immunity with the remarkable potential of vitamin D Several researchers propose vitamin D supplementation could possibly treat COVID-19 or reduce severity at least. So again, we're not looking at treatment of getting rid of you not getting COVID in the first place. We're not talking a preventative measure. If you have high uh, vitamin D, you're not going to get it. That's not the case that we're looking at here. And we're not looking at vitamin D as far as getting rid of COVID as far as you having it and we magically get rid of it and you don't uh, suffer from the signs, symptoms um, or the progression of the virus. What we are looking at and what this paragraph does say is that vitamin D, as far as the study is concerned, again, this hasn't been tested time and time again, but we don't have the opportunity to test it time and time again. We're early on in the progression of this uh, pandemic. So over time, this will be retested time and time again, and we will have a real good answer in a couple of years uh, when that does occur. But for now, what this study is saying is that vitamin D is going to reverse, is going to reduce the severity of the disease, of the virus. And therefore, by reducing the severity of the signs and symptoms that people are suffering from, we could potentially reduce the mortality, okay, the death rate of COVID. Now, that is significant. Again, we're not going to prevent people from getting it, but we're going to reduce the death rate. So let, let's continue on in this. So in a previous report, a significant association between vitamin D status and severity of COVID-19 disease has been documented in Southeast Asia. The report suggests that serum 25 um, D level was lowest in critical cases. Okay, interesting but highest in mild cases, which therefore increases the odds of having a mild clinical outcome rather than a critical outcome as approximately 19.61 times the result further fortified initial hypothesis of vitamin D proponents that a decrease in serum 25 20, uh, D level in the body could worsen clinical outcomes of COVID-19 patients, while an increase in serum 25D level in the body could either mitigate worse outcomes or improve clinical outcomes. Existing literature provides evidence of pre-hospitalization serum 25D is linked to outcomes of respiratory diseases. Hmm, interesting, okay, seems relevant, right? So using cross-sectional data from 6,789 participants in the nationwide 1,958 British birth cohort who had measurements of 25D, uh, Barry et al., uh, reported that vitamin D status had a linear relationship with respiratory infections and lungs function. Pre-admission, a 25D deficiency was also predictive of short-term and long-term mortality. 
This study is focused on identifying patterns of mortality among patients infected with COVID-19 and the possible association between uh, serum 25D level and mortality outcomes. Uh, in this study, age, sex, and comorbidity were added as factors and an outcome variable mortality was analyzed to further provide strong evidence of vitamin D potency for SARS-CoV-2. So now we have to consider how we have to look beyond this. Um, how do you get vitamin D? So vitamin D can be obtained in a few different ways. Vitamin D comes from milk. Vitamin D uh, can come from uh, some sun exposure. Vin vitamin D can also come from a multi-supplement, um, a once a day multivitamin that you get. Um, so a multivitamin, I'm holding one in my hand now, um, that has 25 milligrams of vitamin D in it, which is 125% of your daily value. Okay, and as if you're familiar with a multivitamin, there are some things range from 16%, some things are as high as 310%. Uh, and you typically urinate out what you don't need, but for those that have a deficiency, you need a higher percentage than your daily value would normally allow for. And that uh, allows for deficiencies to be corrected. So again, now we're looking at how do we, again, provide this? Do we provide, is a multivitamin a proper treatment or going to the pharmacy and getting just the bottle, this is vitamin D on it, is that a proper treatment that's going to protect us? I'm not warranting something. I'm not representing this as a solution. I'm not representing this as a treatment. Again, seek professional advice from your primary care physician in order to get proper protocol for you because everybody's body is different and some people can handle things that others cannot. So again, uh, do not use this as medical advice. Uh, you go seek out proper treatment from your primary care physician, someone that knows your medical history and can give you a proper protocol for treatment and for care of your own body. But looking at this study, it's stating that vitamin D could help. So now we have to look beyond that. Like any study, let's look at all the confounding variables that could play a role in this. What other factors? Are we looking at the fact that those that are deficient in vitamin D have increased mortality and increased severity of covid or are we looking at something else? To be a proper scientist, you have to be skeptical. Uh, you have to be a skeptic. Otherwise, you're going to be kind of caught off guard by confounding variables um, that are just always going to be there for you. Um, so those confounding variables could be why do people have vitamin D deficiencies? Why, why are these deficiencies there in the first place? Maybe these people have a vitamin D deficiency because these are people that are have a sedentary lifestyle. They We've also linked having comorbidities to the death rate as well. Those that have other underlying conditions causing people to have vitamin D, D deficiency. And therefore these other underlying morbidities are also causing the more severe disease. Or is there another factor? So one way to test this would be for those that are suffering from COVID to provide them vitamin D, see if that reduces the severity. But again, we have to do this over a longer period of time with many studies because we may not know if it's the vitamin D that helped them or if that person just wasn't going to have severe symptoms in the first place. So we do have to do this over the long term to kind of weigh that out. Uh, this could be over the long term. We could see different strains come about of the same virus. Different strains can behave different ways. Some strains may react to vitamin D and some may not. Some may be more severe than others. Uh, so we could also see that as an issue as that plays out as well in our studies. And again, I can't urge you enough to be skeptical when you read things, and this is an initial study, but I'm not gonna discount by any means what these scientists did and what they found, because this could be a breakthrough in COVID treatment. 
So let's go down and I'm just going to skip right past most of this. And we're going to look at the results and we're going to look at the data um, at the end of this article. So looking at this, we can see we already know that those that are younger have survived COVID uh, more than those that are older. So it shows right here those that are equal or uh, greater than 50 years of age or older. Um, there were less of them, as you can see, 321 versus there were more people affected by COVID that were under the age of 50. However, when you look at those that expired, um, those that died, we see 66% of them, 66.6% .6 of them, were over the age of 50, uh, equal or greater than 50 years of age, versus 33% of them that passed away were under the age of 50. Those that were active had the, but did not die were in the younger of those two groups. We see that those that died were mostly male. However, those that had the virus were mostly female. Now, again, we have to look at other variables. Women tend to live longer than males, so there's reasons for that. It's just how our body makes up. So we, we have to kind of weigh that with a grain of salt as well. And we have to see why is it that males are expiring at a higher and faster rate than females. Looking at comorbidity, this is something that we've known since the beginning, that those with comorbidities were the ones that died most. Um, most people that had the virus did not have a comorbidity. You can see that 50.9%. It's not a great percentage. It's We're looking at really a half and half here almost uh, versus 383 uh, that had, uh, had a comorbidity. But yet 84.9% of people with a comorbidity expired from COVID versus 15% that didn't. So that's, uh, that's a great percentage and that, that is significant. But again, we have to look further, uh, be skeptical. We have to look further and see why is it that this is? Do those that had the comorbidities, is it because they had a vitamin D deficiency or is the vitamin D deficiency because they have the comorbidities? And again, the purpose of this article is this last piece, vitamin D status. So those that had a normal vitamin D status had four, or 49% of those tested, 27% had insufficient and 23% were deficient. But yet when we look at the data, those that had normal 4.2%, even though it was a greater percentage of those that had normal vitamin D, only 4.2% of them expired. So that's saying that a percentage of those with normal vitamin D did expire. Um, that percentage did exist, but we have to consider, was there other comorbidities that caused that? Okay. Um, so again, is it a comorbidity thing or is it vitamin D or is it both? Then we look at those with insufficient that's 49.1%. That's a significant number right there. That's the highest percentage and 46.7% had deficient. So if you take insufficient and deficient and you put them together, that's a significant, that's the majority, that's 90% of those tested. So the difference, so insufficient versus deficient, why is 49.1% of those that expired insufficient versus deficient having a lower? Well, you kind of have to look at the numbers that 27% of those tested in general were insufficient and 23% were deficient. So there was a higher percentage of insufficient versus deficient, and that explains that. And then if we look at the bottom, again, here's some more data. So as we go along, each column gets greater in vitamin D levels. So you can see the overall level and you can see the comorbidity that the lower the vitamin D, the higher the comorbidities, and also the higher the death rate. So if you look at these, the comorbidities are higher for those that have lower vitamin D. So as we said in the beginning, there may be a correlation between comorbidity and vitamin D more than there is vitamin D being the factor. So again, we have to weigh both factors and see which one is it that we're actually looking at here. And then of course, a good study always looks at other 
factors that could play a role in this. So we look at all of the things be versus comorbidity. We look at uh, sex. We look at vitamin D status and we start weighing things out and we start seeing if there is a sufficient and there are showing that there is a sufficient value. The p-value is low, which is showing that there's a very low chance that this study is wrong. And that's good. Table you're seeing in front of you is adjusted for each sex and comorbidity. So the conclusion is that there is a possibility that vitamin D is relevant and that we could treat patients with vitamin D to provide a normal level of vitamin D. This may not, again, not get rid of COVID-19, the progression of the virus. However, vitamin D could prevent the death. For more videos like this, please subscribe to this page. You'll see a link in the lower right-hand corner of your screen that should pop up right about now. Please click the link. We'd love to have you as part of our channel.